Hello, everybody. Jimmy here, Veganic Grower with you. We are live here in Boileau, Quebec, north, uh, northwest Montreal, about an hour and 45 minutes northeast of Ottawa, about the same amount of time. Here in the beautiful Laurentian Mountains, it's 25 Celsius, sunny, gorgeous, absolutely beautiful today. It's a perfect, perfect harvest day. Uh, but if you look out into the forest, it's really starting to feel like the end of summer. There is yellowing in the trees. It's the breeze is shifting so that it's a little colder. Uh, so here it's starting to feel like the end. So we're trying to bring in everything that we can, trying to cash like those squirrels and chipmunks out there are doing. We're trying to glean everything from the gardens that we absolutely can. Um, I have to say that this growing year has been quite difficult for many, many reasons, but one of it has been because it's been marred by the intense Canada wildfire season. We're now at over 35 million acres burned here in Canada. And uh, my heart goes out to all the human beings who have lost their homes, been displaced, all the floral and faunal beings who didn't make it through breeding season, nesting season. Anyway, it's 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 very, very difficult to watch and listen to, um, but this is the reality of the world that we live in, at least for this year. In light of it all, we are still able to procure a solid vegetable harvest. The resiliency of plants will always, always amaze me. It's always shocking to me that they will uh, just produce. That's really what they want to do. The plants will grow, they'll thrive, even if they get too much rain like we have this year, if they get too much smoke, they actually like that. The carbon dioxide makes the plants produce, become bigger, more full, more rich. I can't say it did great for the fruit set, but at least for the plants themselves, some of them were quite vibrant. The kales were quite nice. The lettuces were quite nice. So any kind of our greens did really well from the extra carbon. Um, even if they get flattened by heavy rains or winds, they still produce, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, before we get into the show, there's been a question bantering around, and I'm going to give my take. This will be my monologue today. It is, are your veggies vegan? And this is going to be a veganic farmer's take on this question. So if you're a person out there listening to this and you eat nothing but fruits, vegetables, herbs, nuts, grains, um, seeds, you, you, you don't have any animal products in your life, you don't eat any animals, you don't drink their milk, you don't eat their eggs, you don't pull the fish out of the ocean, you don't, drink, you don't, you don't eat their honey, then everything that you're eating is vegan. Because vegan is defi also defined as the least exploitation possible. Now, you go to the grocery store, you're not going to find veganically grown anything. It's pretty unlikely you're even going to find it at a farmer's market. So if you're buying all of these things, organic or conventional, they're vegan. There is no question about that. Your veggies are vegan food. You're a vegan. You're an herbivore. You're eating vegan foods. Now, the thing about veganic gardening, the thing about veganic growing is that what we have decided to do, what I've decided to do through my book, The Veganic Grower's Handbook, through this show, through Certified Veganic that I'm a co-founder of, we're bringing agriculture to the absolute highest level. There really is no ecological way to grow that is a higher standard than veganics. We don't use any manures, we don't use any byproducts of animals, we don't use any sprays, whether organic or conventional, we don't use any chemical fertilizers from conventional, because it is true that conventional fertilizers and con conventional pesticides and herbicides are more damaging to the, to the wildlife than organic agriculture is. The problem with organic agriculture, unfortunately, is they're doing more tillage than is necessary. They are still using those organic pesticides and, and, and fungicides. All of that creates damage to the balance that we're trying to create as a world that is trying to feed ourselves. So wherever you live in the world, it's also about what you can afford. Now, I get it. There's been times in my life where all I could afford was the absolute least expensive broccoli or even I might not even be able to afford broccoli because it might have been too expensive. So I might just have to get iceberg lettuce because this is all, all I could afford. And there are people out there like this as well. So if you're trying 
to live on a budget and you are trying to start eating vegan or you are eating vegan, don't be concerned. Don't concern yourself with the fact like, are my vegetables grown in a veganic way? Because that is completely out of your control. Here's the kicker where it is in our control, like where it's in my control and anybody who grows their own vegetables and any farmer out there who might be listening, where it is in your control, there is suitable replacements veganically for any other type of fertilizer, compost, or anything else. So if you're using blood meal as an organic grower, which is a slaughterized byproduct from conventionally raised animals, it's a very, very awful product. You can use soybean meal, organically grown soybean meal. You can grow, use alfalfa meal. If you're using bone meal, you can use fossilized bone meal. You can uh, create a compost completely out of plants. So instead of using any kind of manures at all, are, are the yields going to be the same? Are they going to be similar? And I've done reports that absolutely they can be. It is just a matter of understanding. So if you're a grower out there and you're not sure about which way uh, to make your fields, your gardens veganic, well, there are many sources online. There's the Veganic Agriculture Network. There's the Vegan Organic Network. And of course, there is my book, The Veganic Grower's Handbook, which tells you all about it, how to do it step by step by step so we don't miss a thing. Because even for me, it was daunting when I started. Somebody asked me the other day, were you a skeptical veganic farmer? I said, absolutely, I was skeptical. I had no idea that it was even possible. And even when I became vegan, I wasn't 100% sure. So to bring it back down to it, are your veggies vegan? Are your nuts vegan? Are your fruits vegan? Are your herbs vegan? Yes. If that's all you're eating, you're not having any animal exploitation in your life, there's no suffering from animals in your life, and you are eating everything that's vegan. Don't concern yourself with that. Where you should concern yourself is if you start growing, which I hope all of you do. If you start farming, which I wish some of you would do, then there is a way to convert all of our practices over to veganic. I hope that's clear. I'm going to share this later. It's all about all of us trying to get together, live in harmony with this planet in the best possible way that we can grow our own food for us, for the planet, for all the beings that we share it with is veganically, bar none, point. That's it. That's where we're at. All right. So let's get on to the show. Today is about harvesting and preservation. When and if possible, harvest in the morning before the blazing sun, preferably after a night that it has not rained, if it's even possible. All fruits, vegetables, and herbs harvested in damp conditions will have decreased storage life. So if you happen to be out there after a rain and you're picking, say, your green beans, uh, they are not going to last as long either in your fridge or in your cool room than they would have been if they had at least one night of dry. Now, green beans are a little interesting because if you don't harvest them really every couple of days, sometimes they get way too big, right? So you may not have a choice. But the best thing that you can do when you're harvesting is label your packages or rotate it like you see people do in the grocery stores. You know, put your oldest in the front. So if you find that you do harvest some of those green beans after a night where it hasn't rained, well, they should store for about two weeks, right? Whereas the ones that rained, it might only be seven days before you start seeing little markings on them, before you start seeing a little bacterial, uh, bacterial issue or even fungal issue on the beans themselves. Hope that makes sense. If you live in humid conditions where there's significant morning dew, like here in northern Quebec, balance between too damp and too warm. If I have to, after everything I just said, I will always harvest when it's cooler and wetter than warmer. Warm Harvesting warm means that you need to flash cold your, your veggies. So you either need to dunk them into cold water and dry them out really, really well, um, like your beans again, or you need to put them directly uh, into the freezer, a fr refrigerator right when you pick them. Um, I've done this before on other farms where we harvested it at the end of the day. And again, it's not fantastic. It's, it minimizes storage life. So when you're thinking about harvesting, think about all the vegetables in that manner and all the fruits and all the herbs in that manner. If they go into the fridge, then you want to harvest them as cool as possible. If they don't want to go in the fridge, like tomatoes, like potatoes, like onions, like uh, ground cherries, 
well, then they can be harvested later in the day. So if you're trying to understand, well, I don't have enough time in the morning, sometimes I have to harvest in the afternoon. Well, then harvest those things in the afternoon that don't mind. Even some of the other Solanaceae family, like peppers, eggplant, they're a little bit more flexible about when they can be harvested. So sometimes I'll harvest, especially hot peppers, I'll harvest hot, pe hot peppers at the hot, warmest part of the day. It seems to make sense, right? A hot pepper wants to be hot. You pick it when it's hot, it's going to be even hotter. Uh, it's a theory anyway. Well, <laughs> um, so uh, for example, lettuces and leafy greens are already quite perishable and can be harvested damp. Just try to dry them somewhat before storage. So all your greens we like to wash them, plunge them into cold water. Even if it is cold, that takes off a little bit of the dirt, which the greens, the lettuces and the greens really don't like to be stored with. And then we shake it and then we air dry it and then everything is fine. Uh, snap beads I've discussed. If you're like our friends in California, Washington, outside of Spokane, uh, that do not get rain or much in summer, then the earliest possible moments in the day for all. So when I was in Arizona, I used to harvest really before dawn. Um, it got so hot so fast that I was at, it seemed to make sense to me to have a schedule where I was out at 4.30 in the morning, harvesting until about nine, going in the packing house, doing what I needed to do. And then that was basically it. Um, there was absolutely no, uh, it made absolutely no sense to harvest anything in the middle of the day because by the time we would harvest it and bring it into the cool room or into the packing house, it would really start limping, especially if you're talking lettuces or greens. Okay. So there you go. Uh, shout out to a few people. Veg Meg from Quebec. Catherine from Quebec. Very cool. See you. Rhonda T from outside of Spokane. I'm glad y'all could make it. All right. Continuing on. The harvest is an art form. It's like a masterpiece. It's like you're, you're, you're developing a painting or a drawing or writing a book or making music, right? Uh, it's... It's what is in the moment that's going to inspire you. Do not wait for supermarket size. That's the point. So if you go to the supermarket, you'll see these massive heads of cauliflower that are about that big. Well, these are either organically fertilized, hyper-fertilized, conventionally hyper-fertilized vegetables that you may or may not get unless it's specifically uh <laughs> got the right conditions in the right soil. So don't even wait. Don't try. The best thing to do is to understand what the vegetable is supposed to look like, even if it's in its small form. So cauliflower is a great example. We've grown cauliflower every year since we've been here. Sometimes we have had really nice cauliflowers. Sometimes like the one I harvested the other day was that size, but it was completely full. Like you'll see when the cauliflower is completely full, this is just an example. Broccoli is completely full. It'll be nice and tight but the little florets have not started exploding yet, right? If you use that as your guide, as opposed to size, then you're in good shape. Melons are a great example also. This time of year, we'll see enormous cantaloupe in the grocery stores that's bigger than my head, bigger than my head. Uh, even under ideal conditions, like in Arizona, where the days were long, hot, and sunny, the melons never reached that over-fertilized size, right? So most of the time, the varieties we plant are genetically deposed to be smaller anyway. So if we're using an open pollinator or an heirloom variety of seed, um, and seed savers have been saving this, probably what is happening more than likely is they're, they're seed saving from quite a few melons. And some are going to be smaller. Some are going to be bigger, but some are going to be smaller. So they may not be that sort of, again, supermarket size. Cantaloupe specifically are ready to harvest when the netting tans. So when you look at a cantaloupe, you'll see that they start to net. And within those nets, there's like little holes. And you'll see that most of the, mostly when it's growing, it's green. Well, when it starts on that instart, it starts to blush, sort of turn a tannish color. And when you take the fruit and you slightly tug it, it should just go off the vine. If you pull on it and it's not budging, well, then you just leave it there. It's not ready, even if the color is there. But normally what happens, it's simultaneous. The color will change. You go to grab the cantaloupe and it'll just pop right off. Then you know that your cantaloupe is as ready as going to be. 
Now, here in our wet climates, sometimes it's a false positive. Uh, you can have that happen because the fruit is trying to make its seed because any cantaloupe that is fully ripened has fully viable seeds. But it's because the temperature, maybe the, maybe the climate was inclement enough that the fruit thought it was getting everything it needed. So it started to turn its color. And instead, actually what ended up happening is it sort of rotted away. So it did everything it was supposed to do, but when you cut it open, it might not be all nice and juicy and orange on the inside. Anyway, just an example of cantaloupe. Carrots are another example. If a scarlet nantes carrot is planted and the seed producer claims it to be 65 days to harvest, the very first should be ready at that time. Again, under ideal conditions. So you plant the seed, it germinates at the right time, it grows pretty well, you're getting, it got nice irrigation. And after 65 days, you should have a few carrots that are ready. But it does not mean that they're all going to be ready. It's just when the first are going to be ready. It can actually fluctuate anywhere from 10 to 15 days longer. After that, the carrot itself might start putting out small rootlets, which means that all the energy nutrition that was in the carrot is now being used to start growing again. It's a fine line with carrots. Some people live in climates where they can leave their carrots in all winter and dig them out in the winter time and they'll basically stop growing. Um, other people like here, if we leave our carrots in too long, then all of a sudden the wireworms and the beetles and all the other microorganisms that like to eat everything that's in the ground before the dormant period, before the ground freezes, will start eating the carrots. So it's better to pull out your carrots. Whatever works for you. Carrots, they say, will be sweeter after the first frost. Thank you, Rhonda, for mentioning that. What I have found is that if you take your carrots out when they're ready, when they look like they've reached full size, some of them might be only about three inches. Some could be as big as six or seven, depending on the varieties that you're growing. And you either wash them and put them in your fridge, which their storage life will be a good three to four months, or you don't wash them, keep them dirty, but dry, and they will stay in your uh, cold storage for even longer. When they hit that two to three degree temperature and they stay in there, they actually get sweeter in storage. So even though there are myths out there that said, leave them in until frost, they'll get sweeter. It's true, they will get sweeter out there, but they can get just as sweet if they only go down two to three degrees because in storage, you don't want them to freeze. And even in the ground, you really don't want your carrots to freeze in the ground because then they can become mushy. If they start getting ice crystals in the carrot, then they're going to get mushy. There you go. Um, it is better to harvest your carrots a little smaller, anything a little smaller. Uh, the, in carrots case, it will yield usually a sweeter root than if you let them grow bigger, more robust, and they start getting their little rootlets in there. When they start getting their little rootlets on there, sometimes have to wipe them off. They might be a little bit less sweet. Then wait for some kind of cosmetic size. And this really holds true for a lot of things. Um, eggplant is another great example. Eggplant is harvestable when you touch the skin and it's not tacky anymore when it's smooth. So you have your nice, beautiful purple, those gorgeous purple eggplants, and you touch it and you, your finger kind of sticks a little bit, not sticky like glue or tape, but enough that you can't like rub it smoothly down. If once you rub it smoothly down, even if the eggplant is quite small, it's ready. And actually those gourmet eggplants are going to be some of the sweetest, tastiest eggplants you ever have. They're going to be crunchy. They're going to be more tender than if you wait for that big, super side. The seeds are big, and sometimes you cut it open, and it's kind of a little bit um, uh, mealy on the inside. It's almost like you can push it a little bit, push it in, uh, push that uh, char in. Um, if that's the case, then it's really gone too long. Uh, zucchini and, and summer squash is another great example because if they're smaller, they tend to be sweeter, nuttier, more flavorful. If they grow bigger, wow, they're really, really good for baking, for shredding, for, for freezing for later. Uh, you can also cut them open, scoop out the inside, make a nice dish with it and rebake them. That's fun for the big ones. 
But for me, for the small ones, if you want to eat them kind of like a cucumber, the smaller ones are where it's at. Just my opinion, but give it a shot. You don't have to let all your zucchinis get big. You can harvest some small because if you're anything like our zucchinis, once you have a couple of plants, that's really all you need. All right, tomatoes, harvesting. Handle your tomatoes with care and single stack your heirloom or your slicing tomatoes. Tomatoes bruise very easily and any bruise will decrease their storage life, uh, their seven to 10 day storage life by half, right? So if you put your tomatoes in and you start stacking them and the ones underneath are sort of getting their blossom end pushed down on the bottom of the box, the cardboard box or wherever you stack them in, and all of a sudden you turn it upside down, you'll see you might lose maybe a quarter of your tomato. So single stack them. The best method to use are these uh, cardboard boxes. They actually, a lot of greenhouse companies, they will sell their tomatoes to grocery stores in these cardboard boxes. They're flat and they, they can only put them one layer. So you can find all those boxes either back by the dumpsters or just ask your produce department wherever you shop. Hey, do you have those tomato boxes? They'll just give them to you because otherwise they have to recycle them, cost them money, whatever. But you can have as many as you want. Those are so cool because they are made to stack. So you can put a single layer, stack another one, single layer, and you can put, there are my hands, <laughs> you can put like five or six high and it takes up almost no space. And you're talking hundreds of tomatoes in there, depending on your scale. If vine ripening completely, pick gently and more gently in a flat box. I actually recommend to harvest your tomatoes a little less than vine ripe. And if you've never done this before and you don't believe me because everybody says vine ripe tomatoes, vine ripe tomatoes, as long as the bottom of the tomato, I've said this multiple times, if, if as long as the bottom of the tomato is completely the color that you want, so if you're growing a rose tomato and it's completely rose on the bottom, even if the top still is a little pale or even a little bit, not green, but pale, um, if you grow an orange tomato, it's completely orange, red tomato, completely red. They are, they have all the sweetness they need to ripen completely. They're going to be as sweet as they would be if you vine ripen them, as long as you let them sit in a place about 16 to 18 degrees Celsius. So somewhere between 60 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit, and you let them continue to ripen. Um, If you let them vine ripen, what I always find with that is that really it's that day you want to eat it or maybe the next, because if you wait and you cut it open, it's going to be mealy. There's going to be too much water. There's going to be too much something in there. Now, the only difference with that is, is that if you live in a place where it's not humid at all, where it's completely dry, Arizona is a great example, Spokane, Northern California, where we have people, we have veganic growers, um, you can pretty much vine ripe and pick them and wait three or four days and you'll still be fine. They won't get mealy because there's almost no more extra water. They're going to have an incredible sweetness level. But if you live in any place where you get any kind of precipitation at all during the tomato, tomato coloring season, um, first of all, you want to limit irrigation completely. You don't want to water them when, when you start seeing any color at all. Absolutely not. Here, because there's so much humidity in the soil, we don't even water our tomatoes into we don't even water our tomatoes at all. And I haven't watered my tomatoes for almost a month. Because once they start turning, you want them to turn with whatever moisture is in the soil. Anyway, that's specific to us wet growers, dry growers, completely different scenario. So if you're letting them vine ripen, make sure, again, you rotate everything. You put the box with the vine ripened one in front so you know. Um, but you can try the experiment. I've tried it. To me, I taste it tastes exactly the same and even less mealy if I harvest it when the blossom end is completely colored, let it ripen completely, and compare it to a vine ripened tomato, whichever one sweeter. Now, that only works for slicing tomatoes. For heirloom, for cherry tomatoes, they must be vine ripened. You cannot completely get the sweetness of a cherry tomato. They're almost more like a fruit that way, right? So if you pick a green peach, um, even if you turn it color, 
the flavor is not going to be fa famous, right? We say it's pas famer. <laughs> But if you harvest the peach at exactly the right time, vine ripen, and then you bite into it, well, wow, then it's a real peach. The same really holds to, true for a cherry tomato. If it has all the color, if you take one, let's say there's 10 growing, and you take one and you bite into it and you eat it, and you're like, oh, wow, that's the flavor I'm looking for. Well, those are the ones to harvest. Now, those are only going to store for maximum five to seven days because they're already vine ripened. And if you harvest later in the day, which I sometimes advocate for, sometimes you run out of time, well, then it might even be just a little bit less. But tomatoes, just be careful. Even with those cherry tomatoes, be careful. Those you can pile up a little bit more. But even then, sometimes the ones on the bottom, they squish a little bit. So as single layer as you can make it, depending on your scale, you're going to be so much happier. Try the ripening inside once the blossom end is fully colored. And I'm telling you, you're going to be happy. What's great about that too is, is that you can be a little bit less delicate. I mean, you know, we're trying to handle these tomatoes as delicately as we can, but sometimes they don't want to pull off. So you're kind of pulling on them a little bit and maybe you're pressing a little too hard. If you try this other way, it really will increase the amount of tomatoes that you'll end up eating. You'll be in good shape. I've done this for, I, I've been a tomato, tomato, uh, what do I say? Tomato snob for a really long time. So I've tried all sorts of different ways and mechanisms and ideas and, and things that should work. And, and what I can say is this particular way of harvesting them really does work best. Anyway, take it all with a grain of salt. Like I say, the proof of the vegan pudding is in the eating of it. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, you say, ah, he's, he's full of crap. That doesn't work. But I can say it works for me. Some others, bulbing onions are ready when the next fall over regardless of the size so let's say you're growing your bubbling onion bolding onions and you grew them from seed uh the onion will start to grow it'll have a neck all of a sudden the neck will start looking and and the and the green leaves of the onion will start looking a little bit off maybe some bugs are going to start eating the leaves they'll start turning a little brown if you can push over on those leaves with basically one or two fingers and the neck basically it falls over or it's already done so on itself, the onion is ready. If you can, if it's still taut, like you try to push it, and I kind of do this every couple of days right now, if you kind of try to push it a little bit and it doesn't, well, then it's not ready. It still wants to get a little bit bigger size. It's not ready to pull out. Potatoes are ready after the plant's flowers have died, not when the plants have died. Now, you can wait until the plants have died, but, to bend it, but depending on your climactic conditions, it is always possible that the potatoes were going to start getting some sort of disease issues. But you will notice that the, the potatoes, the Solanaceae potato plant, it'll create a flower and then that flower will go to sort of its seed. It almost looks like a greenish sort of hard potato. Um, at that point, your potatoes are going to be pretty decent size. Um, if you live in a place that's drier and you can be convinced of that, you can let them go a little longer. They'll get a little bigger. But once the rain comes in, potatoes are notorious for this. If the rain comes in, the potatoes are almost ready. They will not store as long. And here we can store our potatoes at 33, 34 degrees, one to two degrees Celsius. From basically, what, three weeks ago, we pulled all of ours the first week of August, and they're going to store all the way until the last week, week of May, right? So we're talking almost 10 months of storage. Give it a shot. Winter squash are ready when they are hard when knocked on, like a wooden door. So they're going to sound like that. They're going to sound knock, knock, knock. They're ready. If they're kind of hollow, they're not ready yet. And the stem has faded color from the green that they would be going to sort of a dullish green. Um, their color may or may not be 100% complete. Sometimes with butternut squash is a good example. It has that nice sort of beigeish color, uh, yellowish beigeish, yeah, not yellow, but sort of that tannish beigeish color. And it might still have those little stripes in it that are are there just before they're ready. Well, that's okay because with summer with winter squash, in order for them to be 100% ready, this goes for butternut squash, for candy roaster squash, spaghetti squash, uh, Hubbard squash, curry squash. You want to put them in a nice, warm, sunny location for a good two to three weeks. 
And what's really interesting about this is that all of that color will really liven up even more. So if you pick your candy roaster, candy roaster has sort of like a nice um, sort of orangish, beigeish, reddish color. And it'll get even more profuse that color, which is really, really cool when it sits in the sun. So with your winter squash, you want to do that. Summer squash are better smaller than bigger. However, the bigger ones are better for baking. So that is what we have on certain different varieties. Now, number five, what's, what's something else to consider? Enjoy the harvest. After a gardening season, we are surely tired, but this is what we have been hoping for the entire year. Why we seeded, we maintained, we watered, we transplanted, we weeded, we checked for insects, we checked for diseases. It's all to this point. Take time to smell the flowers, observe the plants and fruits before harvest, bask in the glory of life, enjoy every bite. Me, like y'all, if you have a whole season by this time of the year, you're pretty exhausted. You go, oh man, I still have to bring in corn. I still have to bring in more winter squash. I still have to go get seeds. We're exhausted, but take the time. This is what it's all about. As, as frustrating as gardening is, when the harvesting comes in, wow, you, you've done it. You've done your part. You've done everything that you could possibly do to get to that point. You've worked as best you could with the natural world. Mother Earth shine on you, produced you food that you can eat in a veganic way. It's balance. It's harmony. Look, I'm holding the world in my hands. <laughs> All right. Uh, if there's any questions, go ahead and send them over on harvesting. Just a shout out for my book, Chapter 15, The Harvest. All about this talks about many, many different ideas, scenarios in the back, the crop profiles for over a hundred different, uh, over 75 different varieties or 75 different crops talks about all the harvest tips for every single one. So if you don't have it, pick it up. It has all the information in there. I tried really hard to bust out myths to use the best possible advice so that it is one easy and two pleasurable right so it's all about all right preservation off we go uh four main types also in my book preserving the harvest chapter 17 talks all about some of my favorite methods what you can do what's the best way to process looking at it from a perspective of drying freezing canning which also includes lacto fermentation and cold storage I'm going to put that away. I'm going to make a note on harvesting that we are done at 33 minutes. All right. Drying. Drying is one of my favorites. Takes up the least amount of space. Is really the most energy efficient, especially if you use the Excalibur type dehydrator. Um, we have a nine tray Excalibur. It basically runs from the time of the first herbs and uh, so what are we drying first? We'd be drying mints and lemon balm, oregano. Uh, when all of those start coming in, we will start is basically around mid end of June. And it's now running all the way until the end of September when we start drying, continue to dry ground cherries and apples. What I can say is when we didn't have an Excal Excalibur, and since we do, if I look at our electric bill, it's almost identical. So what I can say is that it probably uses cents. It almost uses no kilowatts, okay? So this is a really good system. It's a really, really low, like when we dry tomatoes or we just dried the chanterelles we were harvesting, um, it's at 135 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 50, maybe 55 degrees Celsius. It's not very high but it's just that constant heat, that constant warmth. And it even takes a while. Cherry tomatoes can take up to 14, 15 hours to dry. But again, it almost takes no electricity. So if you have a chance, check it out. That's best. What I find about drying is it captures the flavor best of all the methods of certain things. And I'll talk about those in a minute. In some cases, it actually brings out the flavor, like for small fruits, apples, pears, and ground cherries. Ground cherries are an amazing one because ground cherries are already sweet enough. But when you start drying them, 
you can actually smell it's like it's like being in a confectioner a, a confectionery like where they would just be making sugary like bonbons that's what it smells like in there just like candy heaven anyway we use these as our raisins instead of buying uh you know organic raisins for the granola i make every morning or every couple of mornings instead we're using our own dried ground cherries and they're almost the same principle it's almost like a dried raisin except it's so much sweeter it's so much full of flavor we also like to dry cherry tomatoes and all culinary herbs and flowers so we like to dry basils and oreganos all of our dried herbs marjoram rosemary say uh, summer savory winter savory and then the cherry tomatoes are the best so if you've ever had sun-dried tomatoes um <laughs> yeah, that's it, Meg. They are so good. They taste like candy. That's it. They can just pop them. It's like they're bonbons. That's all you need in life is ground cherries dried. Um, so cherry tomatoes, if you ever had sun-dried tomatoes where sometimes they're packed in oil, if you dry cherry tomatoes, oh my gosh, what a sweet treat. So if you're making winter pasta and let's say you have your, your winter kale and you have some onions and you have just a little bit of olive oil or a little vegan butter, whatever you want to use, and you're sauteing all that up. And then you reconstitute the cherry tomatoes and put that water in for your pasta sauce and then put in the cherry tomatoes also. My God, it's like a burst. It's It really is a burst of summer. So drying, that's what it captures. We also dry chamomile flowers. That's one of the fl main flowers that we dry. And chamomile is something between that and holy basil is something that we drink every night. So do I have a problem sleeping? No, not really. <laughs> Chamomile flowers, holy basil, be good to go. Other great possibilities are hot peppers, sweet peppers, celery, green onions. People have dried eggplant. Like I said, all the fruits are fine. Um, if you don't have now, Excalibur uh, dehydrators can be very, very, very expensive. Um, so if you don't have the budget and I understand if you don't for sure, and I had one of these before, actually I had two, you can get the round type dehydrators. They're a lot less expensive. You usually can find them at a hardware store or home store or, um, some place like a, like a target or, or a Canadian tire or something like that. Uh, and they work, they work just fine. I, I can't, um, I can't talk about their energy efficiency because I don't know, um, but I do know that they do do the job. So if you don't have, uh, the money, try that. You can also use your oven. You can turn your oven on super low and then turn it off and then put your, put your herbs on like a cookie sheet and dry them that way. You can also do your tomatoes. It might take some time. You can braid hot peppers or like you would braid your garlic. And we have that sort of in our window all the time. And those will dry just fine. So there are under options. And me, I have always wanted to create a solar dehydrator. I just have never gotten around to it. One day I'm going to build it. I just think that this is the coolest idea ever. You have the sun. You have a sheet of glass. You have a system. You have airflow. Should work just fine, right? Uh, you keep the bugs out but you'll figure it out from there. Anyway, something, there are many, many ways, but if you're not drying, you should start because it really is a great way to, to bring in the harvest. And other than freezing, say, cherry tomatoes, where let's say you want to put in, say, a quart bag, you put, I don't know, maybe 40 cherry tomatoes, you can pack into a quart jar something like almost a 1,000 cherry tomatoes once they're dry. You cut them in half and you dry them. All right, good enough. Going on, freezing. This is our preferred method for all small fruits, other than ground cherries, like blueberries, hascap, raspberries, and black blackberries and strawberries. Since we mostly eat, yeah, there you go, Rhonda Nesco dehydrator. That's the one I used to do before. I use them before I can adjust the heat. Yeah, and just like the Excalibur, you can adjust the heat also. There are, I think, eight or nine different settings, at least on the nine tray one. Maybe the five tray one is different. But yeah, again, if you use whatever you have and you'll be in good shape. Um, in the wintertime, we don't buy any fruits. Uh, we'll buy apples in bulk from a local organic orchard. Um, and we'll keep that in our co-room. And basically we eat apples 
and the small fruits that we fret froze during the season, either the ones we cultivated or the ones that we bought uh, on vrac or in bulk. And these are awesome because you just put them in your cereal or you put them in your smoothie um, or you put them on top of your pancakes and yeah, they're a little frozen, um, but they, they, they have all the nutrients that they did when they were fresh. This is the great thing about freezing, especially freezing anything that you didn't have to cook or blanch before. You're getting all the goodness that you would if it was fresh, right? Uh, we don't make confiture or jams and jellies because I never know how much I'm going to eat. Sometimes I'm all about it and I eat, you know, uh, a 250 milliliter, uh, a half a pint in a week. And other times I'll have one there, open it, and I won't touch it for a month. I just, I'm not a big jam and jelly guy. But if all of a sudden I know I want some, well, I can just take the frozen fruit, boil it down, put a little sugar, put a little or maple syrup, put a little lemon juice, and bam, I have my own fast-made jam and jelly. So you don't need to can that in advance unless you really want to. Um, but I do like, I just have to mention this because I don't know how many people out there make pancakes. I love pancakes, especially during the winter time. It's just such a fun process to make. The recipe that I use is buckwheat spelt. So if you're gluten-free, you want the highest protein content of any pancakes in the world, buckwheat spelt vegan pancakes can't go wrong. Uh, we also like to uh, freeze sweet corn off the cob, sweet peppers for making things like fajitas or chilies, and parsley. Uh, which holds the flavor best. If you cut it, it you, you freeze it fresh. You just cut it really, really small. You put it into a half a quart bag. And then anytime you want a little parsley for your, for your sauce or your stews or your roasted veggies, well, you just take a little bit of it out and you just sprinkle it right on. Really, really awesome than trying to find fresh parsley in the wintertime. And we don't even buy it because it's just weird to do so. I don't even know where they're growing parsley and for sure they're not growing any veganic parsley and organic parsley is super hard to find anyway celery also um is really really cool to freeze you can dry it too but it's also really easy to freeze and then that way it'll give your stews and your soups um and your asian foods if you ever done like a like a tofu celery black pepper um uh recipe that's really nice or if you make like a kung pao sauce you can put your celery in there that's awfully nice all right. Anyway, or you can just cut it, cut it up. And, and sometimes the celery that we grow is a little tougher. Well, then we put it to make our bouillon as well as the, or vegetable stock, as well as the celery tops. So instead of discarding the celery tops and just throwing them away, chop them up, put them in a, in a quart size bag, put them in your freezer. Anytime that you want to make your own uh, vegetable stock, just take out the tops and put it right in your vegetable stock. A little bit of celery flavor. Some okay, I'm gonna answer that question, Rhonda. Do you think herbs taste better frozen or dried? I used to dry mine, now I freeze all my herbs, seems to hold the flavor better for me. Good for you, me. Basil holds better dried, oregano dried. Um, chives, I've tried both, don't really like either. Uh, cilantro, I would prefer it frozen. Um, what else out there that I dry? All the Sariette, the rosemary, I dry it. I just, it takes up less space. My freezer is always packed as it is. Sometimes things get lost. Uh, I like the drying method, but if you prefer the frozen method, if you think that the flavor of it is better, go for it. What I find about all herbs, this is a cooking tip. I started my life uh, as in working in restaurants, this was 1635 years ago. I really thought I was going to be a restaurateur one day. So the first eight years or nine years of my working life, I worked in restaurants from, from working in the kitchen, washing dishes, working in the kitchen to becoming a busboy and a waiter, almost a manager, but then I decided to do something else. And I have always found that talking with all the chefs and I've worked at some four and five star restaurants as well. The best way to bring out herbs, whether frozen or dried is to, and this is in Indian food. They do this a lot. Um, you, you, you bring out the flavor of the herbs by cooking them a little bit first before you put something else in. 
So you can actually cook the herbs just a slight bit, 30 seconds before you put your onions in, then mix it all together. Depends on you. You can also put your onions in there first, then put the herb, but that putting in the herbs with the onions, with the, with a little bit of oil in a heated pan is going to bring out the flavor, whether they're dry or whether they're frozen. There you go. Just another tip, but whatever works for you. Frozen works great. Dried works great. Uh, some like to freeze tomatoes, but I think their flower, their flavor is marginalized, prefer drying or canning. And we're going to talk about canning now. Yeah, I don't, we did, we did freeze some. I just don't particularly like it. I, I know that if we get tired at the end of the season, you can just stick those cherry tomatoes or big tomatoes, like, or even your Italian tomatoes, just right into a bag in the freezer. I don't like it, but it doesn't matter what I like or don't like. It matters what you like or don't like. I'm just telling you that drying them really brings out the flavor that freezing of cherry tomatoes won't. All right, continuing on. Sorry, pages sticking together. Canning, lacto-fermentation. For tomatoes and Mexican-type salsa, the canning method is my preference. When we can tomatoes, I sent a picture out on Facebook on this last post that we can not just Italian tomatoes, but heirloom tomatoes at the same time, and it really makes a sweet summer-rich sauce. It's it's so incredible. Um, if you have any kind of heirloom tomatoes that you grow and you want to do a little canning, it is a lot of fun. Just check the USDA or the Canadian Food Guide on um, best canning purposes. There are many different ways of doing it. I have been canning since my homesteading life started in 1998. I've never had botulism poisoning. I'm still here. Um, so usually uh, canning, home canning is one of the safest methods ever because you make it sterile you are only canning what you're trying to can. So it's a really, really safe method. Don't ever be scared. You don't even need, um, you don't need a crock pot. You don't need a, you don't need a water bath can. There are many, many different ways out there. It can be as simple as you want it to be. Just check the requirements before you do. So fan of Mexican food, my recipe for canned pico de gallo will take you to your favorite Southwestern or Mexican eatery. Uh, it is a very simple recipe, recipe, tomatoes, onions, sweet peppers, hot peppers, cilantro, salt, lime juice, a little apple cider vinegar. That's it. That's it. That's all you need. Don't need to put any other spices in there. That is all you need. And if you can that, it's going to make you crazy. There is a ratio. If you're super interested, send me an email. I will send it to you. I've been making the same pico de gallo recipe basically since uh whew, 17 years old so i guess that would be 34 years ago so now we're talking 1989 at a restaurant i worked at i learned how to make pico de gallo i've been making it basically the same way ever since it has just been so good uh lacto fermentation is probably the biggest cottage industry in north america currently almost every small town has a local supplier of sauerkraut and or kimchi and that is for extremely good reason. Taking already good for you cabbage and lacto fermenting it will bring in valuable gut bacteria and increased amounts of vitamin C. It is a super immune boost in the coldest times. Um, we make them both. We make sauerkraut with our huge cabbages and uh, kimchi as well. Sauerkraut is absolutely the easiest. All you need is either a food grade bucket, plastic is fine, Better would be like sort of an old fashioned crock um, that they, they used to make sauerkraut in. We actually got one of these from a great aunt, which is really neat. Chop the cabbage, sprinkle with salt. There's a ratio. Look at it online. You'll find it. Put in a large crock or the food grade bucket. Put um, a plate on top of it. Put a rock or something or a brick or something heavy to push it down. That's it. Wait three to four weeks. Sometimes you need to take the, take the plate off, skim off. There might be a little bit of fermentation that's starting to mold. It's a good mold. Put it in your compost. It, it's a nice compost activator. But the sauerkraut itself is going to be, it should start taking like sauerkraut. The best advice I can give about cabbage, we've tried it in many different ways. The smaller you can slice it, the thinner you can slice it, the better your sauerkraut will be. Um, sometimes big, thick pieces of cabbage, if that's what you like, you can do that too, but depending on what you want. So give it a shot. There are a lot of other recipes for lacto-fermentation out there. I've tried many from friends. Uh, I've 
the only two that we've settled on are the two that I've decided because everything else I just prefer either to eat fresh, canned, dried, or frozen. Um, than actually like people make uh, lacto fermented hot sauce or or um, or salsa. Well, for me, those those foods are already high in capsicum, which is going to be a great immune system boost. They already have a high level of vitamin C from the tomatoes and the and the red and the red peppers. So and even from the the lime juice that would be in there. So you don't really need to lacto ferment unless it's something that you're really, really into. And in which case do it because it's fun. And this is what it's all about. Preservation is fun. Cold storage for any roots you like to eat fresh or keep fresh. Carrots, beets, parsnips, rutabaga, turnip, winter radish, um, as close to freezing as possible. Dirty if possible, but dry in a closed bin. Don't leave it open. They'll dry out. Now, I did have a reader of my book comment that they tried what I suggested, or in the past, they tried what I suggested about everything being dirty, like carrots. And they said, depending on where they get their, got their carrots from, if they got them from a place where they're really, really dirty, a lot of mud, then when they tried to wash them in the, in the fall, I'm sorry, in the early, late, in the winter or in the early spring, it was really hard to take the uh, mud or that dirt off. And when they did, like some of the carrots were rotten. I get it, I understand that. It's about keeping them not uh, wet though, not too humid when they have dirt on them. Now, this year I've also done an experiment. I washed up a whole batch of smaller carrots to see if they would last as long. And they're gonna be the first carrots we eat. So it's for sure they're gonna last three or four months, easy, maybe even five. But again, like our potatoes, we're storing them almost 10 months. And the best possible way that I have found is if they're dry and dirty. Rutabaga, great example, works fine that way. Parsnips, beets, also turnip, winter radish, the same. Now for cabbages, kohlrabi, and radicchio, not so dirty. You don't want um, a lot of dirt on the outside of the leaves or on the outside like uh, kohlrabis because that'll start the microorganisms, the living soil, will start eating into um, those for some of a reason, especially anything that has a leaf. Um, but potatoes and onions, potatoes will let dry just a little bit and I'll just kind of wipe them off. They're still very dirty, but they store just fine. Onions, well, we'll rub them off a little bit with our hands, but a little bit of dirt on them is fine. Yeah, okay, The in the winter time, our, our, our uh, place where we wash, our wash station inside the house, uh, our sink, there we go, there's the word, our sink will uh, get a little dirty, but what is a little dirt? No big deal. And it's not really dirt. It's, it's microorganisms, right? And then they go in the compost and then they go outside and they like it. Uh, make sure it's all in the dark. Um, and again, as close to freezing as possible is the best course of action. Now, there are a lot of guys out there. I just actually saw one recently about humidity preferences, 80%, 90%, 100%. I keep all my uh, foods basically with their own humidity. I don't have a humidity meter in with all the bins of carrots. But what I do know is that if you harvest the carrots, say even at the coolest part of the morning, say it's 10 degrees, 11 degrees Celsius, and then you put them in at two, three degrees, uh, they're, going to, um, they're going to evaporate their moisture. And the moisture is going to end up on the bin. It's going to create kind of dewy drops. It's going to be very wet in those bins. So every few weeks, if you use this method, if you have bins, or even if you have sacks of, of food and don't use ones with holes, that'll, that'll make them transpire. Uh, they'll dry out quicker. Make sure the bags are sealed. Uh, you may need to replace the bag. You may need to just like change out the bag. If you notice that there's a lot of humidity, just watch it. It's all about management, right? You don't just with, with preservation, you don't just, especially cold storage, you don't just stick it everything where it's going to go and three months later go, oh, I wonder if that's still good. No, you have to check it for a while. But once the whole bin of carrots, every carrot is then two degrees, then the evaporation of the moisture stops and it all stays there. Hope that makes sense. Slightly warmer, but still colder, say 50 to 55 Fahrenheit, 10 to 13 degrees will be okay. It'll just decrease, decrease the storage life just a little bit. So if all you have is a house, like a cold room, a room in your house where that you can turn off the heat, uh, that's fine too. Now for things like winter squash and garlic, 
A little warmer is better, 55 to 60 Fahrenheit or about 13 to 16 Celsius. That way, then you won't get cold rots if there is any of those organisms that were in your winter squash or on the skin of your winter squash. They won't proliferate um, if they're at that temperature. Sweet potatoes are the same thing. They do not want to drop that cold. If they do, uh, they will end up getting sort of a, a brownish rot on the sweet potatoes themselves. Now, sometimes you'll see them sold in the in the fridge departments, and I think what ends up happening is it, as long as they're 100% cured and dried, been stored for a few months, then I think you can probably put it in your fridge and it's okay. But if you're growing them yourselves and uh, you take them out of the ground, you really need to cure them at 55 to 60 degrees and leave them there for a few months. Favorite options are insulated cool rooms, a root cellar like I built in Arizona, which was underground. Uh, it stayed basically uh, between 8 and 10 degrees all year long, completely covered with dirt. It was a cement building. Very, very cool. It was fun. Or an under your house basement also works very well. Just make sure there's no heat sources that come on, except just to keep it a little warmer, like above freezing. All right, that's what I have for today. If there's any other questions, shout them over. Other than that, there's some really, really cool coming events in September and one a little bit later on. The coolest one, month of September 30th and October 1st, the Montreal Vegan Fest, the 10th one. I will be there. I've just learned that my friend from the Veganic Agriculture Network, Stefan Grolo, will be there helping me out for the Veganic Growing Extravaganza Kiosk. You can come find us. You can buy your seeds for the year. Uh, we're germination testing all of them now to make sure they're nice and viable for you. You can come and buy my book. I'll sign it for you if you've already got it. You can pick up some materials on Certified Veganic if you're just interested as a, as a grower or a gardener or a homesteader or a small farmer and want to transition over. We have stickers printed that you can buy and put on your laptop or on your on your uh, folders when you're in school or university or on your car to promote Veganic Certified. Um, so it's going to be quite an event. Uh, we're going to be there talking all things Veganic. You can bring bring any questions that you have from the smallest pot in on your backyard to how can we scale this to feed the world. All your questions will be answered bar none. It is for sure. I will answer everything. Stefan will answer everything. In mid-November, this is going to be announced here also by the end of September. The dates exactly is going to be the inaugural inaugural Veganic Summit hosted by the Veganic Agriculture Network, friends Stefan Grolo and Megan Kelly, also of Learn Veganic, collaborated by and with collaborated with, not by, because they're doing all the work, with the Certified Veganic and the Vegan Organic Network. There's going to be a list of speakers talking about everything from home gardening to starting, starting transitioning over gardening to feeding on a full-scale model, maybe appropriate technology for greenhouse growing, all sorts of interesting topics. I know right now they're doing a sort of a sondage, a survey as to what you would like to see. Look at the Learn Veganics website or check Learn Veganic out on Facebook and you can give them any ideas that you want to see for the super cool Veganic Summit. It's going to be in mid-November, sometime between the dates of the 7th to the 19th. It hasn't been finalized yet, but will be, like I said, by the end of the month. Three to four days of content with many speakers out there. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. I'll know more at our next show, September 26th, when we're talking about keeping the gardens covered all throughout the wintertime. What are the best practices for that? How do you do that? And gleaning before the frost. What should you harvest out? What should you let wait before when the frost is there? What can take it? What can't? It's always great being with you all. It's always fantastic. I thank you so much for taking the time to come on live, to listen to it afterwards. Just remember that Veganic Growing, again, um, for those of us that do, this is the highest eco ecological level of growing ever in the world. Like we cannot get higher than this. This is the gold standard and this is what we should all be striving for. So 
If you're out there and you're new to this, give it a shot. If you already buy some of your produce from an organic farmer, let them know who we are at Certified Veganic. Let them know that there are these ideas because they may not even know that there is something possible out there, that there is a way to eliminate the animal suffering and exploitation in the way that they grow fruits and veggies for their customers. You know, no farmer out there wants to be a part of the industrial animal agriculture chain, but unfortunately every other form of agriculture is. So to get out of that, we need to show that there is this other model. And that's what Veganics is for. That's what the shows are for. They're for you. They're for to take whatever you wish from it. And, uh, and for that, I thank you for joining. And as always, peace. And I wish you a good month until we see each other again. Take care. Bye-bye.